So today is Friday, one, the first of two final classes in our course where we present special topics on net, network applications and security. We'll be posting the references and resource folder in there along with a very modest, very concise uh, study guide. And uh, what we'll hope to do today and Monday is complete review of those two topics and then set up a short assessment in module five. You do have a module four assessment that we posted uh, yesterday, I sent email and stated that you needed to have the first attempt logged by the end of this week, 11.59 p.m. Saturday tomorrow. Uh, in order to log your first attempt in module four. Uh, we will have a short assignment and a short solution in module five as well. But these, these will be mini assignments or you can think of module five as a mini module, okay? It won't show on your screen yet, but it'll be quick and easy uh, things to do. And you'll be able to practice some things uh, based on what we show you and, and share with you in class. So uh, without further ado, well, let me ask first, are there any questions or comments or concerns about what we've just shared regarding the 4.3 assessment when it's due, what we're doing today and Monday? Any questions? So can everybody still see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yep. So there are four uh, student learning objectives instead of the usual dozen or so, right? So instead of seeing Baker's dozen, 12 or 13 of those, you've got four here. And the first three have to do with apps. And what we're, we'll do today is cover as much of the material as possible and then post a short video with a step-by-step -step on how to build a Python app to create a TCP connection, a socket, right? To establish uh, connectivity between your system and uh, a mock-up of a server. So we'll have a server that's sitting in the background waiting to connect to uh, your system. And without further ado, this first student learning objective is really a refresher if you think about it. And uh, it's drawn from the previous module. If you don't have this concept solid, what's going to happen next is that some of this, uh, some of the stuff we're going to share and the steps we follow won't make any sense. So if you remember port address translation, you have a single IP address that's associated with a given port number. And, and that's used to identify separate hosts on a private network. The IP address and port number combination is what we use uh, in our applications to define what's known as a network application socket, right? Now, when you have a socket on a client, a system or network host that needs resources or information, and you have a separate and compatible or complementary socket that is established on the server, which is any network host that provides said resource, right? The two together separated by a comma is used to define the, the network session. And in some cases, if it's TCP, we would call that a connection. If it's UDP, there is no connection. It's still a network session. There's still data being transferred and exchanges back and forth, but it's not a solid connection like a TCP connection, right? 
Any questions so far? So a server is any network host that is listening for resource requests. So on the server side, a socket is established and a port and that port is opened where it listens for a client to request a service. Uh, let's check just a moment here. Good morning, Byton. How are you? I'm all right. That's good. Your timing is good. We were just finishing up our refresher about sockets and client server stuff, right? Now, one of the things that you need to understand is that depending on the operating system that you're creating network applications for, uh, the operating system uh, provides resources in the form of an application programming interface or an API. Put another way, operating systems provide a series of or a collection of libraries. You probably already know this because of some of the programming classes you've already had, but there are a series of libraries and established modules and components in those libraries uh, that allow you to work and work with and reuse those uh, objects, right? In Windows, the TCP IP implementations and the API are commonly referred to as WinSock, okay? WinSOC. And that's just something to understand. Whenever you see the reference to WinSock, you, um, you have uh, a Windows operating system in the mix and you're using the Windows API and that's significant. If you're working open source with Linux, they also have APIs, but uh, depending on the flavor of Linux and where you are and what you're doing, uh, those labels change. The important thing to understand is that um, there is this one protocol and it's sort of like the big bullseye for hackers. So when you're talking about network exposures, remote procedure calls, and this is something I'm likely going to edit the module five study guide for. So when systems are interacting on a network, there, there are often remote procedure calls in the mix. In order to work the process between client and server, remote procedure calls are transferred and executed between those systems, right? And there is a specific network service and protocol that's used for RPC. Uh, because of the critical role that RPC or remote procedure calls performs, you'll notice that there's an awful lot of security patches and fixes and updates. And I mean, it's just like a massive bullseye for hackers. Hackers love to get inside this uh, protocol. And so oftentimes there are <clears throat> workarounds like uh, there are encrypted HTTPS um, options to implement uh, exchanges between client and server. So there's sometimes there are encryption uh, components in the mix to try to protect that. Uh, but but the most important thing to understand about all of this is that it's actually a pretty simple process. Even though it can get very complex, it's just important to understand the sending and receiving side of things. Remember that if a port number is lower and it's a registered known port number, that is the server side of the session or connection. Are we good so far? Yes. Okay, so the socket API, right? 
in your textbook, Comer has buku uh, references and material uh, associated with this. And one thing I wanted to mention is that Comer also provides examples of building network apps, not only in Java, but in other programming languages. So if you start looking at some of these references and it doesn't look familiar, that's normal. I just wanna assure you that that's okay. Regardless of the programming language that's used, there are like seven tasks, right? And there are seven steps to the process, seven tasks, seven steps to the process that are consistently engaged regardless of which programming language is used to work with the socket API, right? And I want you to be familiar with these, right? So when you're looking at the socket API, the sockets API, you have the await contact component, right? The make contact. So which one would be used by the server of those two? Which one would be the one using await contact based on what we've just explained about clients and servers and how they behave? All right, Let, let's rephrase the question. Which of the two is listening for a request, the client or the server? It is the server, thank you very much. Very glad you did that. Yep, okay, it is the server. Yes, so await contact would be that component that you'd see on the server side. Now, if the clients are requesting resources, right? then it just stands to reason that they would be the one making the contact with the server that's awaiting the contact. Does this, this make sense? So you do have network app application names and associated numbers, right? Uh, C name, does anyone know what the word C name means? We've been going over this in our DNS solution. The letter C stands for what in DNS? If I create a C name record, what does the C stand for in DNS? Come on, too many of you have already completed the solution. We walked through Client. it. So say again. Client. It is, it is not client, not client. Uh, but client is a C word. Yeah, and that's a fair guess. Hash. Say again. Hash. Did you say hash? Or cash? Oh, oh, I see. Cash. Yeah, you, know, cash. you know what? Cash is also a reasonable guess because that's also a C word. Um, how about if I say the word alias? Alias is associated with common name. Common name, C for common. C name means common name. C name is a term that's synonymous with the idea of an alias, right? So when I have a record, uh, let's see, if I have a host's record, uh, let's see if I can do this. I'm gonna go here. Yeah, let's go here. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Okay, so an alias could be www when the name of the server, the actual name of the server is something like Lilu. Now I keep picking on the fifth element all the time, but on this system, the C name or alias, if this were a web server and I were connecting to the web server, I would create a common name, but if I have just a plain name and I don't have a work group, I don't have a domain associated with it, 
and just have the system name, right? That alias or C name is really critical to what happens here. Now, this hosts record is a special file that lives in Windows machines and in Linux and Mac machines. And essentially, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, when all of these methods for networking were being devised, DNS was one of several naming conventions. In fact, you see, you see ancestors of previous naming conventions in your network configuration. So if you go into your, well, let's do this quickly here. Let's go into our network and sharing center and we go into our adapter and we go into um, our properties and then we go into uh, TCP IP properties and we go into advanced settings you'll notice there's a DNS tab and that's the default naming method, the naming protocol. But in Windows systems, in older networks, they had something called the Windows, it's called WinS. It's not Wins, it's WinS. You're considered a novice and a noob and uh, you know, wet behind the ears, you're green, you must be a beginner. If you don't, if you don't pronounce this correctly, so that's Win S, right? That has to do with naming, Windows naming system or service, right? And then DNS, the domain naming system, is what replaced it all. You also have C names or common names, and what they had a long time ago on a lot of networks was something called LAN Manager. So you have these simple system names and that's back in the day when they were using backslashes. We did cover UNCs in our last class, right? We covered sharing a network resource, yes? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. Backslash, backslash, right, all that. Okay, so let's get back to our uh, study guide. So. A lot of times when people, and I'm just saying this over and over and over and over and over again, you are the, you are the heirs to the computer kingdom. If you're computer science or computer engineering, you belong to the original legacy that started everything 50 years ago. And you learn so much about programming and software development and in computer science, that's your forte. In the computer engineering side, you learn about the hardware and the computer architecture. And why am I telling you this? So computer engineers and computer scientists are all about the code and they're all about the hardware, but there are these other class, there's another class of professionals called IT or information technology professionals. Have you heard of this information technology? Yes. Yep. Okay. And, and they basically, their forte or their wheelhouse is infrastructure, which is a mix of both software and hardware, right? The networks, the data centers, the servers, the switches, the routers, the wireless, all that kind of stuff, right? So here's the thing I'm getting at. They are not the ones that should be the masters, the uber lords of domain naming. You should. But in the 25 years that I have worked in industry, I've seen the most horrific thing happen to software developers who have a really cool network app and it's working on their laptop and then they get somewhere else and they put it on a system and it doesn't work. And they call the tech staff in and they're like, uh, we need you to help us troubleshoot with this thing, right? And I want you to understand that because of the daily activities of IT personnel, they tend to work a lot more with DNS. And that's bad. If you do anything with apps that touch networking, you have to know DNS 
as well or better than they do. And it's because of this right here. I'm telling you that the whole client server network universe starts to come to a screeching halt and the most basic apps just don't work. When you have a common name associated on a network and there's dynamic IP address assignment and the network addresses are always changing. One day this, this server has, right? So if I'm, if I'm on this system, right? And uh, right here, I have an application on a server. A server should have a fixed IP address, not a dynamic address, an unchanging, anchored, concrete, immutable. Like you don't build a house on sand. This is, I'm trying to preach here. I'm trying to give you an analogy here that sticks. If you've been to church, if you've been around in uh, that kind of thing, right? Sunday school, vacation Bible school, you learned about the house that's built on sand. You never build a house on sand, right? It's gotta be on rock, yeah? Rock. So one of the things we want you to understand is that if you have a network address set up that's prone to change, you're gonna have a lot of challenges when it comes to getting simple things to work. And I'll tell you this, there are measures in DNS to automatically update dynamic DHCP assignments. It works most of the time, but not all the time, which is why we have all these challenges. What am I saying? I'm recommending to you that when you learn how to code network apps, you make sure you're dealing with a static, anchored, fixed, unchanging IP address that no one else uses and no one else ever will use. And you have that listed in the hosts file and you create an A record in DNS, both. Yeah, both. Um, all right, any questions about that? Now, C name to computing, right? So when the program is operating, when it's running, it's loading, it's doing its thing, right? What's tied to it? The identity of the system. Let's say that again, the identity of the system, right? Now, of course, we're exchanging back and forth. So send and receive is just the intuitive part, right? Most of this is pretty straightforward, right? So you might have a software name and it's tied to a certain port number or app number. Well, look at this one right here. This is the other one that's overlooked. So this one is overlooked and it creates all kinds of havoc. This one is overlooked. Does anyone know what EOF means? Uh, end of file, maybe? End of file is correct. Give the man a cigar. Thank you. Did you know that a lot of times there are two things that are omitted in network apps that create all kinds of security holes. And again, if you wanna be labeled a noob, a beginner, a novice, a baby, an inexperienced doofus, then you don't account for this business. So your stuff is only working half the time. But then the other piece that really wreaks havoc is this. This is like closing the door. This is one of those components of the sockets API that's also overlooked and underestimated in terms of importance. When you're finished with the data exchange, it's, it's common for people to be so frustrated and irritated by the time they get something flowing back and forth, they forget to send EOF, end of file. And what you wanna do is sever the connection at that point. Send EOF is critical because it's a precursor or a prerequisite for closing the session. So what you're gonna find out is that later on down here, can everybody see this? Yeah. Yeah, you can't close unless you what? 
send end of file. Why can't you close? Because if send of end of file hasn't been sent, then what does the program think? Am I done yet? Am I there yet? Have you ever seen in movies where people are riding in a car and they're like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Have you ever seen that? Yeah. 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 Well, could you please just humor me for a second and put yourself in the shoes of that poor little network application who gets sending and receiving right and is actually doing the listening and accepting. And those things are, by the way, the word bind is really important. We'll talk about that in a moment. We'll talk about bind in just a moment. Hold that thought about bind. All right. But okay. So all of that's working. It's all flowing smoothly. Right. And then it's like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we got the data where it's needed. Yeah. And, and here it is, here it is waiting, 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 but no one ever gets end of file. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Once you send end of file, then you can gracefully close the session. Leaving a socket open is a hellacious, irresponsible, neglectful, and should be criminal, criminal level offense. If there were any logic to our laws in the technical realm, we would have a felony law and incarceration for those who, I know I'm being melodramatic here, but just saying, I want you to do well, live long and prosper. And you won't if you don't get that. And you won't get very far with network apps if you don't anchor your names and IP address, especially when you're trying to figure out how to get it working in the first place. Okay, so if you don't send end of file, you will have fans in the jail cell next to you because sooner or later the hacker will get caught and what they'll do is they'll find out in court, okay, how did you do this? And then <gasps> the jury will shrink back in horror and gasp because, well, you know, the hacker's a bad person, but who left the keys in the car with it running? Oh, the coder, right? Okay, enough said about that. Just wanna make sure. So we've been hammering the most important socket programming concepts, right? Four main stages. Number one, create the socket. Number two, use functions to configure it. Number three, Use it to send and receive. And what's the last one in red here? Close the socket. Close right? the socket. Okay. Now sockets can be used for UDP and TCP. Most network connections with network apps that require any kind of consistent delivery of data packets, right? Datagrams, IP packets, frames on layer two, all that, right? On layer four, it's TCP, right? Now, UDP still gets a lot of work done and it's less common and it's neglected. There are still sessions and the session still has to be closed. And I would guess that a lot of people are leaving those connections, the sockets open and uh, the sessions in play for UDP because it's just not done as much. All right. Each language has its own way of working, but basically, if you understand, this is what you're looking for in each case. Four steps. What you're going to find with each method is a simple flow diagram that looks like this. Now, I want you to notice the difference between the socket process. Which one's longer and more complicated? The server side. The server side. And that's because the server side has to create the socket and then bind that socket, that network access to an application. Now there is a kind of a related topic that I wanted to share with you real quick. This is a quick side trip here into control panel 
So if we go into network and sharing, then we go into adapter settings, we go into this and oh, where is it? Where is it? No, that's not it. Properties. No, bindings. Um, it could be that we're not viewing things like we used to. So essentially, they're, they're okay, in here, I'm going to find this screen. It shows protocols bound to an IP address, right? So protocols and services are bound. The term binding is, uh, is part of that. And some of them are bound first and others are bound like secondary and all that. So binding can be one of those things that's also uh, a troublesome negotiation and uh, and that's something that um, yeah it used to be it used to be right up here in this screen when you go into adapter settings and they move the cheese they put this somewhere else I'll, and I'm using Windows 11 so that's the problem might be quicker and easier to find in Windows 10 or older versions of Windows. But uh, I just wanted to speak about the term binding there, right? So what you're doing is identifying the IP address and port, and then that's bound to a specific service and protocol, right? Based on the registration. And then we're listening. At that point, the client can create that socket and it uses the socket to request and then connect to the port that's listening after an accept, uh, after the server accepts the session, right? And of course you see this send and receive, send and receive, that's kind of a loop, 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 loop. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Last stage is closed. Um, I wanna take some time. Well, first of all, let me ask, are there any questions about the basic steps this diagram related to this, the four stages, right? So just to um, be clear, so like when you're developing your own uh, networking app, that's like the process here outlined is similar to like, let's say serializing or deserializing a file because you have to open it and then close it at the end. And if you don't close it, then something could be wrong with the process, right? That's a, that's a decent analogy. Yeah. I would say that there's a, a similarity there. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good analogy. Thank you for, for uh, offering that. Yeah. So let's take a look at some of the, any other questions? So I want to give you some examples in Java, and I'm going to try to trick you on your assessment. And what I'll do is I'll show you a screen that looks like this, but I won't have a big red circle there, OK? Everybody gets that? I'm not going to have a big red circle or other details. And I'm going to say, hey, is this an example of the sockets API, right? Which programming language and which side of the session does this represent? And what you should go is, okay, I know that's Java. Oh, and there it says what? Server socket, right? So that is something that's profoundly obvious, right? There is a decent, um, there is a decent web reference here, and I just wanted to click on this to make sure. Yeah, Java socket programming examples. Okay. So, a trivial date 
server and client, one-way communication, two-way communication, tic-tac-toe game, right? These are really cool. I mean, all these things are there and they work and you can basically adapt this and uh, see what happens on your own screen, um, depending on your Java development environment. Any questions about uh, that reference in particular? So there are three important classes for this purpose with uh, the Java implementation for the sockets API, server socket, socket, and inet address. Now, inet address gets back to, oh, that whole naming IP thing, okay? That never goes away. So nine times out of 10, when you have a service that's running across a network and it has anything to do with client server applications, when it isn't working, the first order of business is check your DNS, your DNS, your DNS, right? Okay. So here you see the socket listener component, the listener accept while true, right? And then the socket close, listener close. So the socket closes and the listener closes. So closing, closing is a two-step process, right? within the code. Any questions about this Java server example? Okay, client side. Yeah, so why did I say this was a short study guide? Well, it's a lot of big pictures, so it's not, it's not really seven pages long. Um, I mean, two of those pages are pictures. Do you see server socket in this header yeah do you see let me ask the question again i'm sorry i said server socket do you see oh, no. server socket <laughs> <laughs> okay that wasn't intended to be a trick question but it is keeping us on our toes so thank you for Thank you for that shout out, right? Okay, so I'm gonna ask the question again. In this example of code, client side now, do you see server socket in this lead section? No. No, you don't. Okay, so that would be another clue that, okay, we're dealing with the client side, right? You still gotta have a socket in order to work the connection uh, or the session so, so socket is used for both, right? The socket component is used for both. The INET address is used for both, right? Enter the IP address of a machine that is such and such, right? So why isn't it, why doesn't there have uh, in the Java API, why isn't there a client socket? you know, dot client side. Why is it only socket for clients? Um, let me see if I understand your question. You're asking about why is there always sockets? No. Um, so there's the server socket and clearly that's for a server. Uh -huh. but why is for on the client side, why isn't there one exclusively named, you know, in the Java API client socket? Um, all right. So you remember the whole sending and receiving thing? I'm going to spitball an answer. So I'm pretty sure this is, I'm pretty sure we're fishing in the right hole here. You remember that a server is listening, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Yep. So it's in receiving mode. Yeah. But then the socket, right? The socket does both. It sends and receives. So, uh, I I guess I guess the one socket is really 
dual purpose, either client or server side, but the server socket is different because the server role is, you know, it's, it's waiting to, to establish a connection. Um, now I'm, I'm trying to think of a quick way to explain this. Oh, I think, I think I get what you're saying because like you told us, I don't know, like two classes ago, again, like, you know, like a phone, like you, like you explained to us that a phone could also act as a server, right? Like if you, you, um, you wanted to use the data on your phone, to um you know broadcast use as like wi-fi yes. is that like kind of like the reason so like the phone itself that's why the socket itself listens and um what, what is it what does it do it listens and um so so the common the common component right, yeah is, i think yeah. i think what you're hinting at here is 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 a uh, is in the right ballpark your sockets are sending and receiving, but on the server side, you have this additional functionality where you're, you're, you're it has to do with uh, establishing the session or connection and it's in listening mode. So, so the server socket that's there to establish the, or receive the request versus the business end of the data. This is like the front end of the shop and this is the back end where the delivery are rolling out the back of the store. I don't, I don't know if that's a good analogy either, but yeah. Um, I'll, I'll check on some references and I'll see if I can post a quick explanation in the addendum, okay? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll to be continued. Uh, what I'd like to do is make sure we have a chance to take a glimpse, right? So notice that server socket and socket both close, right? So on the client side, you have a system exit and, and that closes the socket, right? Now in C and C++, quick question, am I going to expect you to know all of the different API components for C and C++ for your assessment early this next week? No, no. I, I want you to get the, most of us are working Java and some Python, right? And there are fewer of us who are working C and C++. So I don't want to afflict that on you at the finish line. But what I do want you to understand is that SOC ADDR and SOC ADDR underscore N, this is similar to the two components that, that set the stage for Java, right? You have the server socket and socket, right? And so you have socket bind get sock name listen. These are all these are all uh, functions. I I do want you to be able to look at a list of these, and because because of the the context and format, I want you to go. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's not Java. That's not Python. And then by process of elimination, you need to be able to say, okay, this is um, C or C++. So if you see socket with uh, parentheses, right? The socket function, the bind function, um, that's a dead giveaway, okay? A dead giveaway. And you'll notice the similar process, right? So we set the stage, the sockets are set up, the socket connections are established, and then the communications are controlled, send and receive, and then you have to have a close. So whatever you do, don't forget close, right? Let's talk about Python. We have any Python fans in the audience? We're almost done. We're like, like 60 seconds away. Uh, Python, all right. 
Yeah, if you have, if you've ever noodled around with VirtualBox and you've downloaded uh, a really cool hacking suite, it's open source. There's a distribution out there. It's used for cybersecurity, but it's also used by hackers. So it's tools used for good and tools used for evil. You can easily create a virtual machine that runs the Kali open source distribution. And this includes uh, Python, right? Uh, so Python is automatically loaded. And other things in there are automatically loaded. And uh, there is a really cool book called Black Hat Python. And that's where this reference is from. The thing I want you to understand is that for a TCP socket, right? Notice you still have what? Names. Does everyone understand no matter what you're doing with a network app, there's always some kind of naming thing in the mix, right? And that has to translate to an IP address. So there you go with the C name DNS. Oh, I have a name, I'm turning it into an IP address and then I add the port. And between the IP address and the port, now I have the ingredients that I need for what? A socket, a socket, right? So now I can create the socket and then connect the socket and then send and receive stuff. And then I'm done, right? So this is uh, a little easier to follow. So you first create the socket, blah, blah, blah. Then you connect the client to the server, send it some data. The last step is to receive the data back, print it out. It's the simplest form of a TCP client, right? So what did this hacking author forget to do in this example. Close. Uh-huh. Did he close it? Yeah. I don't know that he closed it. I mean, I'm gonna double check, but all right. We created a socket object. We connected to the client. We send some data. We receive some data and we're gonna view the data by printing it. And, and what and what's the next step? What's the next step? No, I know he didn't. I know he didn't do that. Uh, okay. So one thing I'm going to do is have you do something in Python. I'll try to find an example in Java if you'd prefer to do something in Java. Uh, quick question for those of you that are still in the session before we finish. Uh, are all of you familiar with Python, noodled with Python? It's pretty straightforward stuff. I did some in the summer. Okay. But I mostly do Java. I mostly do Java. So yeah. would all of you prefer a Java, uh, like a quick activity in Java or Python? Java. 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 Okay. All right. Um, would anyone be offended if I offered both and said, oh, the Python one takes two minutes, the Java one a little longer? Yeah, you could do that. And as long as you created the connection, either way to log your credit, would anyone care if you used one versus the other? No. No. Okay. All right. So for a UDP socket in Python, right? Oh, it's even simpler. Right? Socket, create it, send, receive. That's it. It's even simpler because we're not doing a TCP connection. It's connectionless. It's even quicker, right? Very fast. So, and of course, 
your the author of this textbook says again we're not looking to be superior network programmers we want to be quick easy and reliable enough to handle right okay well yeah it's quick yeah it's easy yeah it's reliable but the irony here is you have a black hat hacking textbook title and you're like okay you wouldn't want to help people create an open door on their system um so do you remember that we used netstat-a this is the last part we're right here we're right at the door we're ready to walk out the door 10 seconds earlier this season i asked you to to run a command called netstat-a to generate some output and it had to it showed you ip addresses and ports does everybody under everybody remember that yeah. Uh, yeah. Come on. If you've ever wondered, okay, what dirty, nasty, rotten scoundrel left the back door open and my port is open, that's one way you find it. Everybody, and that's the segue into our network security part, which we're going to cover on Monday. Before we close, does anyone have any questions or comments or concerns uh, about the material presented? Hearing none, I wish you well, good luck on your first attempt of the module four assessment. And we'll see you on Monday. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for a quick, simple, fast and dirty assignment. And I'll just, we'll just have two short assignments. Not, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna use the word solution because that tends to make people think, oh, it's gonna take a long time. Two short assignments, okay? All right.